if you are looking for a way to grow wealth through investing, and, you, and you're in this panel and you do not have a very, very full, rich understanding of what Bitcoin is, don't get started in Bitcoin. Um, if you're just curious to play with cryptocurrencies, what I would strongly recommend is Doge. That, that, while, while Doge is still kind of, a, kind of a, a tip jar for the internet style cryptocurrency, um, it's, and people, the, the community behind it and backing it is not trying to turn into investment. The reason there is so much volatility in Bitcoin is because the vast amount of activity in Bitcoin, the reason that people are buying and selling and mining Bitcoins, is because it's an investment vehicle. It's the same reason why I would not recommend that, why I would not recommend average people invest in the stock market. Because it's it's something that is very, very convoluted, that is very, very difficult, and you, you stand, a, there's a much greater risk that you will lose value by putting it in the stock market, in, in the in specific stocks or playing it, like investment vehicle. If you have mutual funds for your time to fund, fine. You're, you, you are, on the average, maybe better in that. And I, I should also take a, take a quick step back and, and introduce myself. Hi, I'm Nick Farr. I'm an accountant. I uh, am a startup CFO on, in, in New York. I've worked for Wall Street-based startups that develop technology specifically for trading houses. So I'm, I'm familiar with the racket that is finance-based in New York. And, I, and having worked and been deeply embedded in it, I don't trust it at all. <laughs> um, but, but taking it back to Bitcoin, um, I, I guess at this point I, sh I will just field questions unless... Is there any question that's already been posed that I have not answered? Okay, so somebody else, is there anybody else that might have a question that I could maybe try to tackle? Yes. So it comes down to a basic concept of trust. So can you, I'm mean, looking for some idea of how this trust started to build up. How is that we got here? How, why? Well, so like with, you know, Bitcoin, I mean, so the United States, they guarantee their currency, et cetera, et cetera. What is there behind these, you know, other currencies? Um, proof. Well, and that, that's that's the thing. There, a United States dollar is backed by the Federal Reserve of the United States government. It's it, and and, and I'll, I'll take it back. That's what a fiat currency is. That there's and, and this is a slight slight misconception. All money, all exchanges of value that are derivative, essentially have no value. You know, people say, oh, gold-backed currencies are better than fiat-backed currencies. You can't eat gold. That, but, and that's exactly it. You, you can't eat gold. It just so happens that gold has been the historical store of value in human history. That gold has been the thing that if you, if you had absolutely no trust basis, humans knew that they could trust gold because it was rare. It was easy to verify that gold was gold. And, it was, it, and it, even though it had certain decorative uses, um, that was a way to create trust between people who had no other trust relationship. Enter fiat currencies, the rise of the nation state. Uh, you, nation states were able to, I mean, again, this is taking a very TLDR approach about driving you all into Econ 101. Um, nations created fiat currencies. They were essentially backed by nothing except people's faith and trust in the stability of that particular government or system. And then uh, when, and when you see differences in value between, say, the euro and the dollar or other currencies, that's the market essentially pegging their relative trust with each other in various different currencies, <coughs> the economic prospects of other nations, uh, trading relationships between those nations. That, those are the sorts of things that drive the difference in value between currencies. Now, returning back to Bitcoin, the reason that Bitcoin has value is because people who have all of these other currencies have placed their trust with their dollars, with these other fiat currencies, into Bitcoin. That Bitcoin is a fiat currency in the respect that instead of being backed by faith in government, it's faith in the cryptographic algorithms that produce Bitcoin and the reliability and the durability of the system 
of people trading all of these solutions to, to very, very difficult cryptographic problems. And so people with different fiat currencies all came together and said, okay, we trust Bitcoin. I trust at, at some point in time, someone said, I trust that I will be able to get one dollar of value out of this one Bitcoin, so therefore I am trading this person that has a Bitcoin for a dollar. And then then next day you had somebody said, okay, well I trust that Bitcoin is now worth five dollars. And you keep going on further and further and further and further, people putting more and more pools of money into Bitcoin to the point where we got to the one Bitcoin was worth a thousand dollars. And then as people start pulling money out of Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin goes down relative to all of these other fiat currencies. So the trust in Bitcoin is people putting their money where their mouth is and saying, I believe Bitcoin is worth this because I have either traded this amount of fiat currency for Bitcoin or I've sold somebody this Bitcoin for this amount of fiat currency. And I, I hope, does that somewhat answer your question? Yep. Okay. Uh, next question. Well, I was going to say, isn't part of it also with Bitcoin that it's limited? It's that number is going to be produced and then, yeah. 11 million. 21 million. I mean, that, that, is, that is a part of it. That, yes, that there is, uh, but, but that doesn't... There's a built-in scarcity. Right, built-in scarcity, that's not, that, that's a part of saying that yes, there is a finite end to this market. Um, but I mean, in, in terms of like, that's why, isn't that why, I mean, uh, why gold is considered to be so... Yeah, that's 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 one of the properties of gold. That it is. But there are things that are much more rare on the planet than gold. It just so happened that gold is in enough traces on the planet, and that gold became the thing that people trusted. This goes back to Bitcoin in the same way that yes, Bitcoin is finite, but and that you know what the supply of Bitcoin is at any one given point in time, and that's a property that things that stores of value should have in relative. In relative value, but the reason that the amount of U.S. currency flows, you know, grows and shrinks, is because that's a property of the system that it's in. That there are times when people need to trade more value or store more value in dollars, and so the money supply increases. It's when you put a dollar into a, a savings account because a fractional reserve bank and the bank can lend out ten dollars, and then when people don't need to borrow as much money, the money supply shrinks and the money supply grows. But yes, there is there's a finiteness to the elasticity of the money supply. Also, if I'm getting, if, if I'm using terminology that is, that sort of stretches beyond people's understanding or comfort level, please feel free to raise your hand and, and, and roll me back in. But that's, but even the finiteness of Bitcoin doesn't have an effect on market confidence. It, it, yes, that's a prerequisite for a certain level of market confidence in Bitcoin, but it doesn't matter whether there's 11 million Bitcoin or 11 billion Bitcoin. You know, if there's only if there's only eight million Bitcoin now, but and there's only eight million dollars worth of confidence in Bitcoin to, to simplify the market, then one Bitcoin is <coughs> worth one dollar, and those relative values change based on the market's aggregate confidence in Bitcoin. It's the same thing with the stock price. Well, is there something then that is there something then that leads to one form of Currency or something of value like Bitcoin or gold or dollars being more stable. Because and I mean just just to go to the classic example I was saying, you know, like you go back to like the 1930s and you could buy a very nice suit for an ounce of gold. Now if you were to go out today, you could buy a very nice suit for an ounce of gold. But you know you spend $1,500 on an ounce of gold, whatever it is, $1,400. Right now, so you know clearly the value of money it has been changing. And it, Continues to change because we keep releasing more of it. But that's, isn't, how does so based on the fact that there's an elasticity to the supply of whatever currency you're using? How you know isn't isn't the relative scarcity does that have a bearing on? I, I, do you see where I'm it, going it, here? It, it does have a bearing, but again, I'm going to have to point you to market confidence. That between 1930 and now. Uh, you know, that one ounce of gold would buy you very different qualities of suits. It's not to say that an ounce of gold is going to be worth now what it is 100 years from now, or 90 or 80 years from now. There's no way of knowing that. Um, you know, for all we know, science could develop something that will plummet the price of gold. Just like we're very, very close right now to developing diamonds that are indistinguishable from mined diamonds, which it, 
you know, which really scares all of the big diamond suppliers. And even, and even diamonds are kept in finite supply. The De Beers family owns most of the diamond mines in the world to try to keep diamonds at a certain price. It's not the, the value that any particular object has, whether it's gold, diamonds, Bitcoin, dollars, or euros, is dependent on essentially one thing, the confidence that the, all of the people who trade in whatever that commodity is, has in that particular thing at any one given point in time. Even stocks, like the, when you say that uh, the, the theoretical assumption behind the value of any share of stock is that that is worth, that is the present value of all of the future cash flows of that company. That's the theoretical assumption behind holding a particular thing in stock. So when you're looking at stores of value, the value of those stores of value is whatever the market, the aggregate market as we can measure it believes is that in that particular commodity at that present point in time. And those values fluctuate depending upon the confidence in those things. How does that? Uh, Actually, is there, does, somebody sorry, sorry. Else, does somebody else have a, another perhaps more Bitcoin as opposed to e or a longer like question? I guess. How is the dollar Um, how, how is, the question was, how is the dollar value of Bitcoin determined? Um, it's, it's similar to stocks in that, yes, there is a bid price and there's an ask price and that there's this very, very minor spread in that. But it's, it's essentially the mean of all of the activity of people trading in Bitcoin on, any, on that particular day. Or on that, in, in that particular moment as everybody else has. There's, there, it used to be more stable when there was one exchange, when Mt. Gox had the vast majority of the traffic there, and people relied on that because they were doing the most value. It was, and it, it, it was I mean, the closest thing that anybody in the market had, but now a lot of people look at the Bitcoin OTC market, which is a list of all of the transactions that individuals set up amongst themselves, and they decide what, the partic what Bitcoin is. Right? And that's the thing. You're, if you're going to buy one Bitcoin with dollars, it's going to be more expensive for Bitcoin than if you buy 500 Bitcoins with dollars, and vice versa. Um, it, it's just an economy, it's markets of scale economies, that there is a transaction price. There is a there is a price for every transaction, depending on which side you're on, that has to be paid. The same reason it's cheaper to buy mayonnaise at Costco in a giant jar than the a right. jar. It's yeah. more expensive to buy more because the sellers get filled. Exactly. Like exchanges. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, the first coin you can buy five, and then that cylinder is filled, and then five and five and five and five ten and five twenty until just like stock. Yeah. It's not the only charging transaction. No, oh, no. I mean, there, there's a difference between a transaction fee and a transaction cost. That there, that there is a you you have to factor in a certain amount of cost for the time that you spend <laughs> in being in the market, which is different than a transaction fee, which is a which is a network. Um, any other?